It's really great to um, start working more on our partnership with um, the AIIA. We have uh, been involved with the Institute previously uh, through the volunteering programs where um, the Institute supported a volunteer, Catherine Andron, who went to Papua New Guinea. So it's um, sort of nice to show some more of the things that we can do and look at how we can continue these. We're based in South Australia. We're an international development and project management organisation uh, focused on social development um, and education. Um, we're currently delivering pro projects quite uh, broadly around the world, so Asia, the Pacific, Africa, and this year we started going to Latin America and the Caribbean. So we have our regional offices in all of those countries, in all of those regions. Um, and our programs are based around volunteering, which is the ones that most people know about. So um, the AusAid funded volunteering programs. We also manage a number of scholarship programs and actually uh, we're currently managing over a thousand scholarship recipients in Australia. Um, and we have some more specialist development programs that we work on as well. Um, just to put into context what we're involved in, um, the objective of the Australian Aid Program is to assist developing countries reduce poverty and achieve sustainable development in line with Australia's national interests. So everything that we do tends to also follow this, um, this statement. So what are the volunteer programs? Um, Australian Volunteers for International Development, it's funded by AusAid. Um, and Oz Training is one of the core partners that delivers this program. The other two partners involved are Australian Volunteers International and Australian Red Cross. Uh, last year they delivered more than 850 volunteers. Um, this financial year the government's uh, committed to delivering 1,000 volunteers. So it's, it's a big program. Um, Oz Training has three streams within this program and we'll be delivering about 700 of those 1,000 volunteers this year. We have the Youth Stream, which is the Australian Youth Ambassadors for Development program. That's for people aged 18 to 30. Uh, assignments, the length of volunteer placements, three to 12 months. Um, and we're normally looking for people with about one to three years professional experience. So we are still looking for skilled people. Um, it's not sort of a straight out of school or gap year program. It does look for some professional experience. Then we have what we call our Australian Volunteer Skilled Program. This is for anyone aged 18 plus. Our oldest volunteer was 82. So um, it's really quite a broad program. <laughs> so it's not just all about the youth. Um, that program assignments can be quite short from one month right up to three year placements. Um, and that one we're looking for more professional experience. So obviously it's looking for people with a bit more um, experience under their belts. Uh, we also work with Australian business volunteers to deliver some short term business volunteering programs. Um, and they're much more short term, one to six month, very focused going in doing something like writing a business plan or uh, doing some accounting, those sort of things. Um, pretty much any sector. <laughs> we have volunteers doing work across many different areas. Um, each country has its own priority sectors that we work in. So rather than saying um, we only do agriculture, we only do education, it will depend on the country um, that we go to. And where are we currently sending volunteers? The list just keeps getting longer. Um, yeah, we've just started going into the Caribbean uh, this year and Latin America. Last year we expanded into Africa, so the program is getting bigger and bigger as obviously um, AusAid is also looking at, at sending or doing work more globally. Uh, we place volunteers within host organisations, so the idea is a volunteer works alongside the local staff within that organisation. Host organisations can again pretty much be any type of organisation with a focus on sustainable development, but most of our volunteers would be based within government departments, NGOs and educational institutions. And we also partner with a lot of Australian organisations through this program. Uh, they work with people that they already partner with to develop assignments. They help us to source volunteers from their networks. They mentor our volunteers whilst they're on assignment. And they also sometimes provide extra resources like educational materials or templates. Um, and it's a great way for organisations to support their international partners. And that's what the Institute did. So, 
that's enough about the actual programs because that's the boring stuff. Now we're actually going to hear from some of the volunteers, which I think is much more interesting. So hi everyone, I'm Lauren. Um, I was in the Solomon Islands for two years. So I had two quite varied experiences with two quite different organisations. So it was a really good opportunity um, and it really sort of gave me quite a good understanding of the different ways aid's done in, in Honiara and the Solomons. Um, this is the photo of the view from where I lived. Um, so I just sort of, that's probably my favourite thing, the thing I miss the most <laughs> in many ways um, from the Solomons. But um, I've sort of, I'm going to keep my, my discussion quite informal. My photos kind of may not match up with where I'm speaking because I kind of prepared them not in conjunction. Um, uh, so first off, I should probably say where I worked. My first placement was with the Honiara City Council. I was working... Um, it was called the Climate Change and Women's Advisor. It changed when I got into country, which is quite common when you're a volunteer. And I just worked as a women's advisor. So I worked with my counterpart. Um, her name was Janet Key. Uh, and we sort of were, I was helping her to um, build up her capacity and skills to deliver programs under the Council for Women. So the Council was quite underfunded um, and it was quite challenging. We really had very little to work with. Um, and then my second placement was with the Law Reform Commission. Um, and that was um, far more structured, it had far more resources because it was underneath the Ramsey Law and Justice Program. Um, just in case, because it's an acronym, Ramsey is the Regional Assistance Mission to the Solomon Islands. So when the Solomons was experiencing its um, civil unrest, they asked for assistance from Australia and the, all the countries around them. And Ramsey was what was put together. So Australia leads that. Um, and it's been rebuilding the Solomon Islands um, for the last almost 10 years. So this was my house. Um, I lived in the, um, as I call it, the Purple Palace with three other, two other volunteers. Um, you may be able to see at the front of the, up the steps, there's a big water drum. That was one of our main water sources. Um, so we had two of those. Uh, um, so we had to readily stockpile our water. Power went off frequently, so I learnt very quickly to appreciate all the things we take for granted back here in Australia. Um, that was my view. Um, it's the Honiara Central Market, and that's sort of a view of Honiara City and the main port, um, and that's sort of really about as big as Honiara is. It's, it's very small, it's very underdeveloped, um, it's quite polluted. So there's a lot of um, work that needs to be done to help rebuild and develop the country. But I'm sure you probably want to hear more about what I did. This is where I worked um, in my first placement. Um, this was the International uh, Youth Day, which is one of the UN days, um, which my um, division at the council would organise sort of the international days. So we had International Women's Day, International Youth Day and International Children's Day. Um, Solomon Islanders love um, marching bands and having big parades. So whenever there's an international day, there'd always be a big parade um, down the main street so traffic would just kind of stop and um, hop in it and walk with everybody. Um, so I worked in this building behind us, behind um, in the background. We had pretty much power went off um, every day um, for a period of time between 10 and two, 10 and 12 and 2 and 4. No water, no computer, no internet. Um, phones regularly didn't work because the first year I was in country there was only one phone provider. Um, so it really made you realise how challenging it was to do work um, effectively when you don't have all the resources that we use every day in Australia. Um, and it was really hard when I looked at what my friends in other uh, organisations were doing um, and sort of trying to make the role work. Um, but I think, you know, what I achieved in this position, because it was very challenging, was I had great people to work with. I learnt pidgin, so I learnt the local language, um, and I developed good friendships. And we worked on a community basis, so I had much more contact with people in my first placement, um, going out and speaking to women and communities. Do you find that word of mouth is, is a very effective communication tool? Um, it, it can be, um, in the Solomons, particularly the coconut like news. Um, I, w I relied a lot on, I suppose, um, you know, speaking to the other volunteers and, and relying on my, on my counterpart. She had really good knowledge and it was using that knowledge and going out there and supporting her to, to, to be confident to go out and do that. 
but it was hard because we didn't have a lot of resources to, to really implement anything. Um, so we did, we did achieve some things, but it was very hard to do that. Uh, I think when I was thinking about the achievements, it was much more intangible with my first one. There were less clear project outcomes at the start um, for various reasons, um, and we had some staffing issues. So I can say that we, we organised based on community consultation and identifying gaps um, at a networking event that was really successful, working to, we got lots of um, organisations and representatives in the women and gender sector to come and meet and talk about what they do because one of the things we observed was there was a lot of overlapping and people not knowing what other organisations did and a lot of duplication or competitiveness in the sector. So that was something that was really positive and I understand that that continued after I finished my placement um, because I tried to make what I did sustainable. Um, they'd already had a few volunteers before me um, and it was really important that you know they didn't always rely on someone coming in um, and, and doing things. My second placement, which is from this one, it was at the Law Reform Commission. So with this position I was largely working on sexual offences um, because we were reforming the penal code and that was the focus of the year I was there. Um, so these were the wonderful people I worked with and I also had um, an Australian ad supervisor. She was a Ramsey advisor um, and she was fantastic. She was a really, really good person to learn from and she was really good at getting the team together. And for me, it was a fantastic um, learning experience to watch her. She was very experienced in capacity building um, and development. She'd worked um, with Indigenous Australians for many years in Alice and Darwin. So I learnt a lot from working with her. And then I had sort of an informal counterpart relationship. Um, so rather than with just one person, I worked with um, Philip, who's galling the teacup, uh, Daniel, who's next to me, and then Kathleen on the end. Um, yeah, they were fantastic. Oh, okay. I, the rest of my photos, I think, are all just nice shots of the Solomons. But um, the, law, the, the LRC was quite different. It was, for me, it was a very luxurious position. We had internet. Um, we had a fantastically resourced office. We had um, a generator, so when the power went off, we weren't affected. We had air conditioning. It was f a fantastic um, environment to work in. Um, and it was quite different. I worked in the office. Um, my role was to do research and legal um, work and support my colleagues who then would be the contact point out to community. Um, law reform is quite slow and it's more long-term change. So it was something that I developed, I achieved my outcomes, I did my, the work, um, but it'll be many years before those things are probably implemented and put into place. Um, but what I did do, uh, I wrote uh, an in-depth report on sexual offences sentencing um, in the Solomons, so looking at what the problem actually was and getting some evidence to support the work that I and my colleagues were doing. I wrote um, some legal research papers on sexual offences against adults and I also worked in collaboration with my colleagues to develop a new office manual. So that's something that definitely would be ongoing um, and the design was to harness the uh, corporate knowledge of my colleagues and sort of so that when they move on in their, their professional careers, the information's not lost. Um, what else can I say? How, how long have I been speaking for? I'm really bad at keeping track of time. Lauren, yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, having followed over many years Australia's aid program, whether it's involved government assistance or the volunteer corps, mm -hmm. it becomes very interesting as to how much capacity is developed mm. and how sustainable is it. Yeah. And uh, the AII at the national level uh, had a conference earlier this year which involved a case study of Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion generally was if Ramsey goes home, uh, the Solomon Islands just implodes on itself. It goes nowhere. It goes backwards. Yeah. Now, okay. this begs the question, mm. notwithstanding all the effort and the fantastic effort that you put in, et cetera, et cetera, why can't we have 24-hour uh, electricity in the country? Uh, why does it take years for you to see your um, 
law reform changes taking place. Well, uh, and you can just go on asking these hmm. questions of what's the fundamental problem, why it's not actually going ahead in incremental stages, sustainable uh, on the way. Well, I think Ramsey's um, had quite a, a successful, it's been quite successful in improving and building the country back up. But because it's working in conjunction with the Solomon Islands government, it's working to support them sustainably and build their ability up so that they're fixing the problems rather than us coming in and replacing the power problems because it's just an old system that couldn't handle the, as the country's growing, it, you know, particularly Honiara is getting bigger and bigger, it couldn't handle that. Um, I think I could see a definite improvement, um, <coughs> what I could observe from hearing about what Honiara had been like um, to how Ramsey had had a positive impact. Um, as you might be aware, they had a riot in 2006 when the election was held um, and uh, Chinatown got burnt to the ground, some significant buildings were burnt down, and part of that was because Ramsey had underestimated um, the problem and they hadn't built up the police to, to handle the situation. I was there for the next election and there were no riots. It went really smoothly, um, and part of that was that they effectively built up the Solomon Islands police to be able to handle that issue on their own. They were ready if there was a problem, but nothing arose. These kinds of things do take time. I don't think that if Ramsey left, everything would collapse again, but whether it's, it's been effective at addressing the really underlying problems that cause the tensions, I'm not an expert. I can't comment very well on that. You know, there's, there was still tension between different groups, so um, the, the main tension that it, all the civil had, uh, unrest had happened between Guadalcanal and Malaitan people, so they're the two most populous um, provinces. Guadalcanal is where Honiara is, Malaita is quite close. There was um, a small riot when I was there my first year um, and uh, it was over a soccer match. So at the end of the, it was between the Guadalcanal team and the Malaitan team. Um, I can't remember which one won, but the upset team that lost um, rioted. They ransacked the, um, the Football Federation's office, um, took all the money that had, from the game, then burnt it to the ground. That building was right next to the building I worked in. Um, like 20 metres from the entrance of where I worked. Um, so when I came into work on Monday, it was just this smoking rubble. And that was, you know, that, that's 10 years, oh, you know, it was nine years after, nine years, ever how many years after, and it's still, there was still that underlying tension. But I think it's been effective at, at building up the capacity, but it's still got problems. The government's still corrupt and it's, own way and um, you've got to work with this with them um, and build the country up to want to make those changes rather than probably coming in and making them for them. Does that, I don't know if that answers your well, question. It does. <laughs> I think there are two issues. Yeah. One is you're underlining social tensions mm -hmm. and I appreciate what's involved in that. That's not something that you can fix very quickly. Mm -hmm. But the whole governance program that goes on, and I've spoken with people from the Solomon Islands and other parts of the Pacific uh, in some detail, uh, informally on things. Yeah. And part of the cultural issue is governance isn't at the heart of terribly much. It's uh, the politics that overlays it. It's all about uh, nepotism and uh, well, the cult, patronage yeah. and God knows what else. That's the sort of issue that yeah. is that going to where it would go back. We appreciate, of course, that yeah. um, you can't get a meteoric change within 10 or 20 years. Um, but anyway, yes. You, you yeah, the political the stuff was fascinating. Watching that the election and how they pick their Prime Minister or and everything was quite different mm -hmm. to what we do here. It was very interesting and it's, it is all about factioning. They actually get it wrong there. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, as you, there are no women in Parliament, so they don't, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> The, you know, it's quite different, so they, they, the, all the constituencies have their member, and then all the members get together and vote, but it's done, in a, it's done over a course of a few weeks, and they develop these factions that sit at hotels, and, you know, publish in the paper, you know, this is this hotel faction, and they'll have a big photo of all the members, and then someone will cross to the other side, and eventually, when they've got the right number, they vote, 
And, um, but they had a change of Prime Minister since I left. Um, only one Prime Minister has actually made it through an entire term, and that was during the period of the tensions. So he was probably not really <laughs> um, Prime Minister at the time. Um, so it was a fascinating place. I loved living there. Um, I think that the changes I had, um, the stuff at the LRC, um, I've, I, I keep in touch with my colleagues. I know that the work I've done is being used. Um, and I've, you know, I've developed friendships and I think that with perhaps sometimes with the volunteering, at least from my perspective, is it's about developing those personal relationships and maybe the changes you have are in those small ripple-like effects that you, through your friendship and contact, you influence people's thinking and help change the way people approach things um, rather than coming in and having ongoing change because it is hard for it to be sustainable when you're only there for a short period of time and you know it's, it's you can't go back always and see that it's still happening or ensure that it is um, unless another volunteer is going in and doing the same work and I heard through through some of my colleagues that you know the Law Reform Commission is no longer getting Ramsey the same Ramsey support so whether that will have an impact on my work um, you know it remains to be seen so um, I have some other photos from the other experiences I had in the Solomons, which was just seeing this amazing country. Um, it's a really beautiful place. If, if, um, but there's barely any tourism, so it's a very untouched place to visit. Um, it's a bit hard to probably visit if you don't live there to get out into the provinces and see things just because everything works in Solomon time and making those connections, but it's a really, really amazing place. Um, when you say the provinces, mm. you really mean the other islands, don't you? Yes, so that's what they call them. Yeah, Sorry. I know they yeah. do. Uh, and they do that in order to avoid saying the other islands. Um, but it's always struck me about the Solomons that you cannot make, no matter what you do, a solid integrated state mm. out of a group of islands that are roughly co-equal. Mm. There's got to be a top island. There's got to be a boss. There's got to be a central focus. The Solomons, like Vanuatu, not quite to the same extent, lacks a central focus. There is no top dog. How do you get your message? You, you work in Honiara. Mm. But how can you feel in Honiara that anything you do is having any effect outside hmm. that island? Well, I can't comment on my first placement because that was centrally Honiara based. Um, yeah. With the Law Reform Commission, um, the year before I started with them, they went out and did consultations. They went to every province, every um, island, uh, to get their views on the changes to the criminal code because it hadn't been changed since the British were there um, and then they would you know that the, the idea was that <coughs> when we made reforms they would incorporate the views of the people and it's hard to do um, because you're also trying to bring in new ideas because the laws have changed so much everywhere else um, my colleagues would also do radio shows that would be broadcast out to the islands to educate and inform um, about what law reform is and what kinds of things we're doing. But I think what you're talking about, one of the hardest things is more so that there's no perhaps cohesive national identity because everyone is identifies with their province. He belongs to his island. He yes. Belong and to your village where you go home to in Christmas is your home. And Honiara is not seen as kind of a home. Um, which is why one of the reasons Honiara is very polluted and it's very dirty is because people don't treat it like they do their village. They don't care as much and they throw their rubbish onto mm. the street rather than because their home is out in the province they've come from. Um, so that's one of the ongoing challenges that I think the government faces and whether they can effectively address that. Um, they, they're busy with their big man politics sometimes. <coughs> so gets lost, I think. Um, but it is a challenge that's ongoing. I have a very pessimistic view about this. Uh, it's, a, 
I don't believe it's possible to create a nation state out of a group of islands that are more or less co-equal in weight and bone. <coughs> there is no centre. Wow. I can't really comment on that, sorry. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. All right, thanks, um, Thanks very much, everyone, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, my name's Sean. I was a Youth Ambassador for Development in Suva, in Fiji, where I was a swimming sports administrator with Fiji Swimming. Um, and actually, prior to going on my assignment um, in 2009, I was a former intern at the Institute. I actually interned remotely from Brisbane, working with um, Melissa Conley Tyler uh, on the Institute's risk management plan for 2009. And um, I just finished my, under, uh, my international relations uh, undergraduate degree, so I was very keen to go down the international relations uh, route or that career path. Um, and then this uh, Fiji Swimming uh, Youth Ambassadors for Development assignment popped up. And um, I was kind of a bit iffy about it at first, about uh, taking it on, but my IR experience certainly wasn't lost on me uh, in my year taking up a sporting assignment. So what I wanted to touch on today were just two things really. Uh, the first were the kind of professional be benefits you can sap out of a sporting assignment and uh, the second thing the overlap between sports and international relations and uh, one actually exists believe it or not and um, some of my observations of that in Fiji. Now whenever I uh, quote my job or my volunteer assignment title swimming sports administrator um, it's usually met by a few chuckles, followed by a comment that I was teaching kids to swim. Um, the fact is I hardly got wet all year. There were a lot of tremendous uh, organisational experiences that I um, undertook or went through. Um, swimming's a sport, or competitive swimming, um, is a sport that's got a tremendous following in, in Fiji. And they were really growing rapidly and still are today. So they really needed someone uh, full time to run things on the administrative or the governance or um, side of things. And so all the professional uh, tasks I had are listed there from running committees uh, which were staffed by volunteers uh, who didn't want to be there and didn't like each other too much uh, through to writing press releases and managing two grants from the uh, International Olympic Committee and the Australian Sports Outreach Program. Um, one of the recurring <coughs> because of the lack of the political or ministerial level engagement between Australia and Fiji, um, one of the recurring lines that kept popping up during my year there in 2009 was people to people links. And um, sports uh, really became that medium fostering those people to people links between Fijians and Australians. So we had a lot of interest from the Australian High Commission uh, through the Australian Sports Outreach Program like I just mentioned and also um, I was able to, and also the, yeah, the Australian High Commission, and I was able to do a press conference with um, the then High Commissioner, James Batley, before he was kicked out of Fiji. Probably one of the last press conferences he did. And um, that's certainly something professionally wouldn't be available to me if I took up an assignment in any other sector. We also had a lot of interest in the United Nations around health, safety and well-being. Uh, as a quick aside, um, a lot of youth ambassadors in country um, are expected to be experts um, on a whole range of things. In my case, fixing um, pool pumps through to uh, being an expert on uh, biomechanics and physiology. And I think that's what the UN were expecting out of me. So to pull back from that joint initiative because we were too busy, but we had uh, a lot of interest nonetheless. And then lastly, because of the, just the sheer lack of political stories, uh, interesting <coughs> political stories in the media, um, because of censorship, etc., um, the exposure of sport was really raised a lot, and a lot of uh, there were a lot of opportunities to um, work on the professional skills side of things in terms of public communications. Now, in terms of the um, political situation, swimming or well, sports and swimming in, in uh, being specific, it was actually a lot more exposed than uh, you might think. Um, as everyone would know, Fiji was excluded from the Commonwealth in September uh, 2009 and one of the corollaries of that is exclusion from the Commonwealth Games. And uh, swimming is a sport that you work tremendously hard at uh, without the sort of same monetary incentives in Fiji as there are in say rugby or um, soccer 
uh, to some extent. And when you subtract these big international events, um, it really uh, raises a lot of questions. And uh, a lot of our swimmers were not angry, but certainly disappointed. I remember being interviewed by Radio Australia about some of our swimmers' reactions there. Um, in terms of cost, the uh, military regime actually added uh, quite a bit to some of our budget. Um, in terms of uh, the sanctions, any, uh, any Fijian, but a lot of our national team who had connections to the regime, no matter how loose they were, were uh, prohibited from travelling to Australia and New Zealand. So, um, and that was also uh, prohibited from transiting through. So um, if any international meets or big regional meets for, for qualifiers were held in either Australia or New Zealand, they weren't allowed to attend. And then any other meets, uh, say beyond Asia, they had to actually fly around because they weren't allowed to transit through. So quite insignificant in uh, geostrategic terms, but uh, significant to some people nonetheless. Third point I've got here, Chinese foreign policy. This is probably one of the most interesting um, aspects of my year. The facility that I worked at, uh, the National Aquatic Centre in Suva, was built by the Chinese uh, government for the 2003 South Pacific Games. And uh, when I, so it was constructed, finished in 2003, and when I arrived in 2009, it looked like, I thought it had been built in probably like the 1960s or 1950s. Um, there'd been no real consideration uh, put into the kind of climate and the kind of terrain in Fiji. So uh, things were quite worn and what complicated things further was uh, all of the, um, all of the um, components that went into the pool and all the other uh, sporting facilities as well. The parts could only be sourced in China. A lot of the instruction manu manuals were written in Chinese. Um, so it was an absolute nightmare. We had uh, seven uh, pumps for the uh, Olympic sized swimming pool, uh, but only two were working um, at the, uh, during my year that I was there and it was impossible to fix. Um, in response, the Chinese government did send a uh, engineer or technician out. He was supposed to come for two weeks. I met him and then on the third day he just disappeared um, and no one <laughs> knew what happened to him. So um, that was probably one of the most strangest experiences um, I had during my <coughs> year in country. But, what was really interesting to note was just the being front and centre in the uh, um, to the contrasting uh, approaches to aid and development. The Chinese uh, one is all obviously driven very much by short term, in kind uh, interest, and uh, the Australian uh, volunteer program and the Australian aid program obviously places much more of a premium on you know sustainability, capacity bu capacity building, these kinds of things, and. Um, actually remember uh, not long after shooting off an email to um, Fergus Hansen for the Lowy Institute just recording my observations and I think one of the really important points um, working at a Chinese built facility was that uh, infrastructure inevitably raises questions of governance. Um, that doesn't just go for if you're building a pool but the Chinese are very active in uh, building ports, uh, they're building a hydroelectric dam roads, how you service these things, how you maintain them, how you manage them and run them are inevitably uh, governance questions and I think a lot of AADs are trying to answer those kinds of questions when they do their work in country across, across a lot of sectors. And the last two points, I think um, you know, as a, as a youth ambassador for development or Australian volunteer, there really aren't too many people who are closer to the people um, and closer to the actions. So whenever any new project or, or programs announced, you know, in a country, um, there aren't too many better people to at least give some insight into the um, reactions of people or the incentives or, or things of that nature. Looking globally at the at sports and international relations, uh, I think you can really see that sports really is the medium to engage almost absolutely anywhere in the world. Um, right to Play, which is a big international NGO whose logo is the uh, ball on your on the screen that um, make a really important point that sports is, is one of those avenues where you can transmit values, um, how to respect rules, how to take a loss, working hard to achieve goals, um, discipline, hard work, those kinds of things. They're much harder values to transmit, um, I guess, in other sectors of volunteering or if you're working um, you know, out of the fourth floor of an office building. Um, the United Nations has taken a a keen interest in sports, that's the logo for the, well that's the um, 
acronym there for United Nations Organisations for, Organisation for Sport, Development and Peace. And um, in 2006, Kofi Annan, who's not having a lot of success in Syria, but he initiated a UN interagency task force on sport, development and peace. And um, they made a really in, uh, interesting point that sport is uh, still seen as a byproduct of development, uh, not an engine of one. But I think slowly that's changing, particularly in our region. A lot of sporting assignments are coming on online. So just finishing up, um, there's that old saying that in a classroom, the person who learns the most is usually the teacher. And I think there's a lot of that in an AAD assignment. Um, you're not going to change the world, obviously, but at least on my own patch of governance, I was able to leave my host organisation, Fiji Swimming, in a, uh, in a better place than when I came along. And, um, you know, from my uh, work in sports, I was able to keep my interest up in international relations and move on to a position with the UN in, in Port Moresby, which is probably a uh, good um, motivation for another presentation at some stage. But um, look, I mean, if anyone's interested in taking on a sporting assignment, uh, the key point it really is that sports is, is not just sports. You're dealing with a lot of professional, managerial kind of things, and there's tremendous uh, room for growth professionally, and um, you can at least effectuate change. Uh, so it can be a very uh, rewarding experience. Cool. Thank you very much. It's that we advertise the positions like we, like we would advertise jobs. And so you go to our website every month and have a look and see if there's any positions that you're interested in, and you apply like you would apply for a job. Um, it is quite a lengthy application process because one of the things we're looking through for that process is how are you going to cope when you get in country. Um, so we do do psychological screening as well. But we're not going to change somebody in country. If you get there and it's not the experience you thought it was going to be, we understand that too. And, uh, we'll try and help you find a way to, to stay or maybe move to a different position if that's what needs to be. But uh, we do understand that you know, for some people it isn't what they thought it was going to be. So it doesn't reflect necessarily badly on the individual? No, no. And we've had people who've, who've mm. left early um, or finished assignments early and gone on to do other assignments. And actually Lauren's first assignment finished a bit shorter than expected and we still let it come back mm. and do another one. So, <laughs> and so you know, there are things in place for that. Yep. I can say, I think from my intake, we had 10 volunteers and I think definitely three or four left their placements early. Um, for, some for health reasons, but some were because the jobs weren't what they wanted and they couldn't change to anything else. Um, so they went home. Um, another girl broke her arm really badly and had to come back for medical reasons and then, you know, I couldn't go back. And what's the duration of placements? In <coughs> um, so the average probably is for the youth program is about 10 months. Um, for the skilled program it's probably 18 months but they can go up to three years for the skilled program, so they can be a bit longer term um, assignments. We don't tend to have anything, we do have three month assignments, but they're very rare uh, because we feel like three months you can't really even start building the relationships you need to be able to, to build the capacity of the organisation. So what's the handover process? I mean, if you're taking over from somebody else, yeah. another volunteer, is there a sort of a handover process? I'm just thinking about the continuity. We are working more closely with our host organisations to have that happen mm. now, uh, where we will have a program of assignments. So we'll say, okay, think about five years. You know, how would you like assignments to build on each other in five years? And so what time frames do we need volunteers to come in so that there is that handover process? That's probably something still fairly new that we're trying to implement. One of the things we've changed this year was the youth program used to have three distinct intakes a year. So it was very hard to, to line up to have those handovers. We're now doing more of a rolling mobilisation. So we're able to, I guess, be more responsive to the needs of the host. Can I ask all of you, is there any particular situation or event that has occurred while you've been doing this that will bring you to say in 40 or 50 years time to your young grandchildren, this is what you used to do. I mean, is there any particular thing that you will always remember and think, I'm so glad I did that. that anything that just stands out or is that not a situation you've struck? The Chinese foreign policy example is very pertinent. But um, no, I think it was, it was probably just the, the, the um, 
the community, like the swimming community, and yeah. the bonds that I formed there, away from you know comp- you know sports, away from competitive swimming, which really sort of stands out. But I think, um, yeah, it's a good question, and um, I'll tell you in fifty years. <laughs> I might not be here. <laughs> <laughs> the overall experience is something that um, I will never forget. I, for me, when I first thought it, the first response is often the tra- amazing travel opportunities and things I saw in the country that I'll probably never get to see anywhere else. Um, but the whole experience I loved. Like I, I, whenever I meet anyone that's vaguely interested in doing a, a volunteer position, I will rabbit on about it because I think it's a really worthwhile experience and I think that if more people could do it, it's, it makes the world a better place, just having that opportunity, um, even if it's only to appreciate what we have at home um, better. Um, probably living, actually, living in my house the first three months, with first three weeks with no power was a challenge. Um, we had three extension cords with three lights that lit up bits of the house, and we had lived like that for three weeks, and that was when the power came on, that was a really happy day. <laughs> um, so that was, yeah, you know, learning to cook in candle, with candles and all those sorts of things were very, very humbling experiences. Uh, you just made a point about Chinese foreign policy, um, what you learnt about Chinese foreign policy. What did you learn about Chinese foreign policy in respect of their uh, activities in Fiji? Well, I, I really saw the shortcomings of of going th- going at things and in the short term, uh, just passing over in kind infrastructure donations. Again, like I made this, this sort of comparison to the Australian aid program, where we place the premium on sustainability, capacity building, looking at things in sort of broad, in a long term uh, picture, and keeping things up, uh, you know, working on the continuity side of things versus just that short term immediate, uh, I guess, gain. Would, would you say? Would you say, as a consequence of what you've just said, uh, that if you wanted to talk in terms of aid to an underdeveloped country being, amongst other things, a process by which one earns brownie points, uh, China would seem to have lost brownie points in Fiji, whereas Australia has won brownie points. Is that is that a fair conclusion? Well, I'm not Look, I think the the sort of official line is that um, it's not a competition. And I think there really are definitely ways you can work together, um, you know, and everyone can score um, brownie points. For example, you know, if I were to stick or my if I were to put put in place uh, the systems that would uh, fix the management of the pool and the running of things, um, and then you know, I guess. Uh, um, and for those to sort of uh, go through and another ad, put another Australian volunteer pick them up or just to see how things are going now, um, you can really sort of match up that governance side of things with the infrastructure side of things as well. Um, so I think, yeah, there's definitely room for sort of scope and, uh, scope, pardon me, for overlap and um, how these things can work together. And it's not sort of, it shouldn't become a competition if we can score you know, the, more, the most points in, in the shortest amount of time. Uh, you can definitely work together. How much do you act kind of as advisors, putting forward in a positive way, particular advice, or how much do you sort of stand back and wait to be asked for advice? It must be a bit tricky in that you're a volunteer, you're not sort of in a, an official position in government or organisation that you're working in, so you can't sort of direct people to do things. So I'm just interested in this sort of relationship that you have to develop with your counterpart or with the organisation that you're working with. It's hard because when you go in, you know, um, I know from my experience in my first placement, you know, I was seen as, as someone of um, expertise and knowledge because I've been to uni and, and that sort of thing, but I felt very much like a novice going in um, in this advisor capacity, which was my title. Um, and 
I kind of did get put into a bit of a leadership position at a certain point because the director of our department or division resigned and everyone wanted me to do that role. We were a small office, of, really there was three women and this group of young volunteer males. Um, and I really felt uncomfortable by that because it's not sustainable, you know, and I wanted my, to build up their confidence in themselves to do the role, which I tried very hard to do, but it, it was constantly a, a balance of um, not just thinking of it as a job of I'm just going to go in and do that task and then it's done, um, which is sort of how we do work you know, generally, and having to sit back and encourage and support and nurture the ability already of someone to do that. Um, I don't know what you found, whether people yeah. looked at you and thought. Yeah, well, I think there was that sort of, there's a kind of, um, you know, people I don't think really understood that I'd have to leave after 12 months and I couldn't sort of linger around and it was a very sort of time expired uh, assignment. Um, so, I, I mean, I definitely was conscious from day one the fact that I wasn't going to be there after 12 months. So, in absolutely every piece of work that I did, I made sure that there'd be mm. at least some scope for continuity. Um, I didn't want to get to the end of 12 months at the start of 2010 and just uh, come to a screeching halt, uh, drop everything and expect things to uh, uh, continue on. But I mentioned the committees there um, in the presentation and that's something I really worked hard on was uh, properly setting up these committees so that at least be accountable and then um, accountable to the executive, um, but also matching up the right people for the right kinds of roles. And they're all obviously all volunteer roles, um, so people wouldn't get paid, there wouldn't be that monetary incentive, but it was at least trying to link up the right people to chair those committees who are passionate about what they, what they, uh, their interest in swimming that would go at least beyond, uh, you know, six months or, you know. And so I made sure, you know, like I say in absolutely everything, that I wouldn't um, just drop the ball after 12 months and then things would sort of fritter away. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences with us and well done to both of you for taking on such a challenge. Um, it was a very interesting talk for us. I think something quite different from what we usually hear and wonderful. So thank you. Thank you.